you for that. <clears throat> the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this morning to the book of Numbers, chapter 14. Excellent service so far, hopefully we can keep it going. Numbers 14, on Wednesday evening, we began with Numbers 14.1 again. Let me just review where we are. 14.1 says this, then, again, reference to the negative, after the negative reports of the ten spies, all the congregation lifted up their voices and shouted, they cried. And not only did they shout, they were shouting against God, and really Moses and Aaron as well. And then they also did something else. The people wept that night, Operation Crybaby here. And as we have noted, the majority, as Rick brought out, Pastor Rick brought out, hasn't learned a thing. Because instead of making good decisions from a position of strength, which is to trust in the faithfulness of God, they have made bad decisions from a position of weakness, which is the fact that they are living in the emotional and arrogant complex of sins. Therefore, in verse 2, it says, All the sons of Israel, therefore grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation not some of them but the whole congregation said to them we wish that we had died in the land of Egypt or wish that we had died in this desert here it is once again they're blaming Moses and Aaron they're blaming the leaders it's always the leaders fault and that's exactly what they did though Moses as a great leader learned to stand firm against the crowd that's what a leader has to do. He has to stand firm against the crowd and not give in to public opinion or public pressure. Please notice, therefore, in verse 2, they blamed Aaron and Moses, the leaders. But then in verse 3, they go on to blame, ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we complain about anything, Anytime you complain about your husband, your wife, your family members, your pastor, your, your employer, the employees, anytime you complain, you're ultimately complaining against God because God is the one who puts you in that situation. God is the one who is with you in that situation. God is the one who brought those people into your life. God is the one who determined when you would be born, the color of your skin, your gender, the time in which you would live. So every time you complain about anything in life, you may be complaining about people, and you may have a legitimate case. Maybe they are mistreating you, but that's not the issue. The issue is you are ultimately complaining against the Lord. He is the one that puts you in that situation, and basically most of the situations we are in, we put ourselves in, ourselves in anyway. Isn't that true? But thank God he's still there, and he knew what decisions we were going to make, and so that's why he brings in such principles. I just finished my book, but I'm editing uh, the whole thing now. He brings in such principles on the ten, about like the 10 problem-solving devices. Why does he give us those? So that we can, instead of complaining, we can apply the problem-solving devices that he has given us, which answers all the questions that we may have. But it's always interesting. Look at verse 4. Well, verse 3 says, notice what they they do now they blame the Lord they said why is the Lord verse 2 they blamed Aaron and Moses verse 3 now they're saying why is Jehovah bringing us into this land to fall by the sword notice they're blaming God and they're saying they're going to be defeated in war did God say they were going to be defeated in war no, God said they were going to be victorious in war. So they're not, they're, not, they're not even believing what God's word said. And so why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Then here comes the lie, the lie of giving excuses and wanting to blame someone else or saying, you know what, this is the real thing I'm concerned about. This is an outright lie by these individuals when they said, our wives and our little ones will become plunder." 
That's their conclusion, you know? And then he goes on to say, well, they're going to become plunder, our wives and our little ones, as if they really care about their wives and their little ones. If they did, they'd get ready for battle to protect their wives and little ones from the enemies that they are about to face. Their conclusion is what? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Egypt is a type of the world. And this is when a believer comes to a point in his life where just because things are not going right in their life at this particular time, in the Christian realm, they'll say, I had it better before. I wish I could go back to the way things used to be. You have forgotten the way things used to be because the way things used to be, according to the Bible, is called vomit. Vomit. Our past has been filled with vomit without Jesus Christ as the center of our life. Our life is nothing but vomit. And when we go back to it, it's like the dog going back to his very own vomit, as Second Peter brings out in chapter 2 in verse 22. So their conclusion is this. Would it not be better for us to return to the world, to return to the slavery that we had? So then they said to one another, notice their, their so-called human solution not the divine solution. They said, let us appoint a what? A new leader and let us return to Egypt, the world. It's always interesting how people think that they can solve their problems by blaming others and electing a new leader electing a new ruler in their life, electing someone else to be in charge. They're only going to, excuse me, if you're here, you never heard, if you, you're here for the first time, you're probably not about to hear, you probably never heard what I'm about to say, but get used to it if you want to continue to come. They're only going to do one thing. They're going to do the same thing they've been doing, bitching and complaining. And they're bitching and complaining against God, not just Moses and Aaron, but against God himself. So they said to one another, let us appoint a new leader to return to Egypt, blaming others, electing a new leader. In fact, if there's any real weakness in our governmental system, you know what it is? It is to think that persons we elect as leaders somehow are going to solve our problems. Are you listening? If there's any real weakness in our governmental system is to think that the persons we elect as leaders, they're going to somehow solve our problems. And therefore, they're already thinking of electing a new leader, going back to Egypt, going back to slavery. Egypt represents the world under the biblical principle of typology. They want to go back to the cosmic system, the way things used to be. Sound familiar? We all probably have done that one time or another. Even in our backyard, our own backyard, we have to deal with the media that says to us every day, let us go back to the way things used to be. We'd rather have the previous administration. We want it to be like in the olden days. Let us go back to the way the things used to be. Let us go back to the previous administration. Let us give our enemies billions and what did we do in the previous dispensation? We gave our enemies billions and billions of dollars if they promised not to hurt us. We'll give you billions and billions of dollars if you promise not to attack us. We say to a nutty little country with a nutty little leader, and we live in fear. Let us reward our enemies because they did not hurt our military soldiers. <laughs> and while we do so, you know what we have, we, have, we have become? We have become a laughing stock to the world. A laughing stock to the world. All I can say, brethren, royal family, is that I hope and believe, I hope and believe those embarrassing days are over. It's time to kick Skabala, not eat Skabala. If you know what I mean, look up the word scubala. You see it's even rarer than what I just said. Now, I don't know what your Bible says, but I know what my Bible says. My Bible says, and I believe what my Bible says. Do you? I believe what my Bible says. If you have your Bible should be equal to mine. I believe such doctrinal passages like Leviticus chapter 26, 7 through 8, where the Lord says, but you will chase your enemies. You're going to do what? chase them. You're not going to run away from them. You're not going to give in to them, make peace treaties with them, buy them off. No, you will chase your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword. 
Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you will chase ten thousand. And your enemies will fall before you by the sword. That's what I believe. That's what a country who has Jesus Christ as its leader should be thinking. Not making peace treaties with liars. Individuals especially of the Muslim faith who are told to lie to Christians, lie to Jews, make peace treaties and don't keep them and do your best to annihilate them and get rid of them on planet Earth. And we give them billions and billions of dollars to support that nonsense. Yeah, let us go back to the way things used to be. Not for me. I like, how, I like another passage you're familiar with. In fact, go to it. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Look at verse 40. I don't know what your Bible says, but I know and believe what my Bible says. When David faced the giant Goliath, notice what we read in such godly passages like 1 Samuel 17, beginning in verse 40, it says, And he, and this is after the Goliath kept on challenging anyone in the Israeli military to take him on one-on-one. -on -one. That whoever won the fight, they would have to serve those people. No one would come forward from the Israeli military except for one man. And he wasn't even in the Israeli military. He was a shepherd boy. And it says he, David, took his stick in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And I told you before, there's five smooth stones because there's five giants that he's going to kill with those stones. The first one will be Goliath. He put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Then the Philistine, the giant, remember he is a giant, came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. This is really two on one, by the way. He, had, he was so big that he had a shield bearer. He had someone carrying his shield. That's how big his shield was. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance, a young little boy. And he was like very, very young, maybe 18 or 19. And all of a sudden, the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his, that is Goliath's gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beast of the field. However, notice the attitude of a child of God who knows that he is a child of God and that Jesus Christ has given, given him the power to overcome the giants in life, the giant problems, whatever you're facing today. David's attitude is given. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. Notice that. He had a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts means Jehovah. Jehovah of the armies, host means armies in the Hebrew, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have, uh, you, whom you have what? You have taunted. In other words, you come to me with ballistic metal, missiles and threats in a large military, North Korea. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you are taunting. They should be living in fear of us, not us living in fear of them. Verse 46, this day, David says, this day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. I'll strike you down and I'm going to remove your head from you. Not only did he kill Goliath, he also cut off his head. And he, pointed, he actually went around with Goliath's head and showed everyone, this is the giant. This is the thing that you lived in fear of. You know, in Isaiah chapter 14, it says that the day, one day, when we, if God gives us the opportunity, we don't know how much of an opportunity we'll have, but it says one day we'll see Satan, many will see him, and they're going to say, is this the one? That's what we lived in fear of? This one? And we'll be shocked. All our lives, we lived in fear of him. David's going to go around saying, this is it. This is what you've been living in fear of, this giant. Now this giant no longer lives. I got his head. He didn't say, let's make peace treaty with him. Let's give him billions of dollars if he doesn't hurt us. No, give me a pebble. Give me a stone. Take your ballistic missiles. Take everything you have. I've got the Lord Jesus Christ on my side. You're not going to defeat me. That's what the Lord should. That's what the attitude of the Lord's people should be. So he says, notice this. That's right. You can give the Lord a hot clap. We're still not done. We're just getting started, by the way. I'm going to be a little Pentecostal this morning. I can feel it coming on. Ooh, yeah, the Holy Ghost is coming. I think John got me pumped up with the right and the left. So look at this day, the Lord will deliver you up in my, into my hands. I'll strike you down 
ground. I'm going to remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky. In other words, your army is going to be defeated as well. And I'm going to give them to the wild beast of the earth. Then all the earth may know that there is a what? A God in Israel. And, all, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he's going to give you into my hands. No matter what you're facing today, what kind of giant is in your life, no matter what kind of Goliath is in front of you, you should have that attitude, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. Get away from me. It's the kingdom of darkness that should be living in fear of us, not us living in fear of it. We're God's people. I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says this in Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Do you believe it? Want to go back to the way things used to be? No, I want to go back to the fact that we're going to have a weapon now. We're having weapons. And I believe God's going to bless this nation as never before, as he seems to be doing. If we, we will just learn to get along and start realizing that we're members of one another instead of fighting among ourselves. I don't want to go back to the way things used to be. I want to have leadership, and I want to have the royal family becoming a part of the pivot. I want to go forward in the plan of God. I'm not going to live hoping and praying the rapture will come so I can be delivered from the mess that I've made for myself. Well, I can't wait for the rapture. Why? Well, I owe a lot of money. I want, to, I want to die. The Bible says you're, when you go to heaven, you're supposed to owe no man nothing, by the way. So you should be paying off all your bills, not going out saying, I'm going to max out all my cards. The rapture is coming. I mean, for some of us, if we do the rapture is coming, the first thing we do is get every card we could and go max it out. Say, oh, yeah, I'll pay it at the end of the month. Won't be here, but I'll pay it. Now, my Bible says no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. You're God's people. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Je Jehovah. I don't know what your Bible says. Mine says in Psalm 33, 16 and 17, the king is not saved by a mighty army. Notice, the king is not saved by They're going to have a two million man army. Yeah, North Korea, you know, they, in China, well, China especially, they will kill you if you, you have a, a female baby. They, they will have you have that female child aborted because they want more males. They want to have a 200 million uh, man army. I don't care how big the army is. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory. That's any kind of weapons. Nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Why? The battle is the Lord's. In Psalm 46, 7 through 7, I will not trust in my bow, says David, nor will my sword save me. But thou has saved us from our adversaries, and you've put to shame those who hate us. You see, if we get a problem, people say, we have to go back to the way things used to be. No, we need to start living in what God's word says who we are as members of the royal family. We all got problems. You see, we got a problem. The majority of the world hates us. So what? Don't you think the majority of the world is going to hate you? Why? They are jealous. They're jealous of our economy. They're jealous of our freedom. Of course they're going to hate us. Who told us the world would hate us? Jesus did in John 15. He said, he said, the world hated me. They're going to hate you. Why get shocked that America is not loved by the world? I love what my Bible says about the same thing. In 1 Samuel 24, 6, it says this, Far be it from me, David said, because of the Lord. He's talking about Saul, and they accused him of killing Saul or trying to kill Saul. And David said, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord Saul. He's calling Saul his Lord because Saul was king. The Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. What is he saying? Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Don't touch God's people. Why? He'll protect them. He'll protect them. That's why we should have no fear. My Bible says some very interesting things, like in Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory doesn't belong to the horse, to the weapons, to the air force. Victory belongs to who? the Lord. He is on our side. That's why we're going to have victory. Psalm 44, 6 and 7. For I will not trust in my bow, nor will, I, nor will my sword save me, but thou hast saved us from our adversaries. You have, Lord, and you've put to shame those who what? 
those who hate us. Now, if you don't believe that, believe my final passage in this particular principle that we're noting. Go to Romans chapter 8. And let me remind you of what God wants us to be uh, secure in. And this is why we don't want to go back to the way things used to be. We don't want to be like the children of Israel, living in fear and doubts after seeing all the tremendous victories God has given us. Romans 8, 31 talks about this. Paul the Apostle says, what then shall we say to these things? The fact that everything we work together for good in Romans 8, 28, and the fact that God's already given us the best that he heaven had, which is his son, Jesus Christ. What then shall we say to all these things? Here's what we say. If God is for us, who is what? Against us. Who cares who's against us? God is for us. That's all that matters. We don't care who's against us. He who did not spare his own son. God said, I'm going to give you the best I have to offer. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for who? Us all. How will he not also, now that we have his son, freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? Christ is Jesus, is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes, he prays for us, think of it. The one who controls human history is praying for us at the right hand of God. And we're going to live in fear of what the Middle East or what the Koreans are doing, not, not or what the Asians are doing, not us. We should be living like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. How about distress? Nope. Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Nope. Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. That's when we're living for Christ. We're considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Just because someone dies, that doesn't mean they've lost. That means victory, absent from the body. Face to face where? With the Lord. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other cre created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us from him, will it? If we don't live in that, we're going to be individuals that want to go back in the past. And what do you want to go back to? The garbage and the nonsense and the vomit that people used to live in. I don't know about you. I want to go forward in the plan of God. I want to have victory. Yes, I love if the rapture comes, but if it doesn't, I'm going to do my job as a dual citizen. I'm a citizen of heaven. That's where I belong. That's where I come from because I'm now in Christ. But I'm also a citizen of this country, and I'm going to pray for our leadership pray for our leaders, pray for our government, pray for our military, and believe that we're not going to live in fear of what the enemies are trying to do to us. We're not going to learn. We're going to learn from the Jews. Don't do what they did. They complained, and they murmured, and they blamed God, and they blamed their leaders for everything that they went through when they should have been blaming themselves. Using Operation Rebound number one, rebound and recovering and going forward in the plan of God. I remember what the Jews had actually learned. Go back now to Exodus 14. Remember what happened to them when they left Egypt? Apparently they didn't. They forgot. That's why they're living in fear. They want to go back. They want to go back. So they're now running away from the Egyptians. The problem is that there's mountains on their right. There's mountains on their left. There's water in front of them, and the Egyptians are behind. They've got nowhere to go except toward the water. But the Bible says, Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his entire military, his horsemen, and his army. They overtook them camping by the sea beside Faharoth in front of Baal-Savan. And as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very what? Frightened. This is the same crowd as Rick brought out who saw the 10 plagues in Egypt just a few days ago. And now they are living in fear. They became frightened. And notice what this. They, they saw the Egyptians marching after them. They became frightened. So the sons of Israel, what are they doing again? Cried out to the Lord. They're not crying like, Lord, help me. They're complaining and they are murmuring. Then they said to Moses, here it is again. Who are they going to blame? The leader. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the wilderness? 
Why have you dealt with us in this way, Moses? <laughs> Who are they blaming? Moses, bringing us out of Egypt. We'd rather be in slavery, remain in the garbage the way things used to be. Do you? I sure don't. The Bible says in Revelation 2 that it's good for us to remember from whence we have fallen, from where we came from. It's good for us sometimes to remember what it was like before without him, without Christ, and to realize how grateful and thankful we should be now with him. Because no matter what we face, he's never going to leave us or forsake us. Amen. Now, they said, notice what they said to Moses. Is this not the word we spoke to you when we were in Egypt under slavery, saying to you, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? We want to remain slaves? For it would, have been a, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians, remain in slavery, than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not what? Fear. That's what they were doing. Do not fear. Stand by and see the deliverance of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, here's a man of faith. You will never see them again forever, meaning they're not going to heaven. Forever means they're never going to see these individuals again. Why? Verse 14 in that very popular verse, because Jehovah the Lord will fight for you. Notice the next part. While you keep what? Silent. Relax. He is in control. Keep silent. Don't worry about the way things are and what's going on. The Lord is going to fight for you. All you have to do is keep silent instead of complaining and murmuring about what God is allowing to happen in your life right now. That, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me about this, Moses? He says, tell the sons of Israel to go forward. That's what we need to do. Forget about the past. We need to go forward in the present. We need to reach forth to the things that are before us so that we can attain the spiritual life and the resurrection life now in this life that God said we could have if we're willing to go forward and forget about our past. Back to Numbers 14. So they want to get rid of their leaders. That's their plan. But as you can see, if they only just got rid of their attitude, that would have been their solution, not getting rid of the leader. That's their plan. And here's a great principle that reveals their thinking. The plan of people who are irrational is always to retreat and withdraw. Quit. Operation baby. I'm not going to let church anymore. Why? I don't like the way he talks to me. I don't like the way the congregation doesn't applaud for me like they do for John when he sings. I'm not going to be up here anymore. I'm going to quit. I'm going to go home. I'm going to take my little toys, and you're never going to see me again. I'm not going to go anywhere because I can't go anywhere. There's no perfect church. And if I find one, it will no longer be perfect because I'll be a part of it. So now it's imperfect. So I'm right back to where I started. <laughs> People want to withdraw. They want to quit. Reversionism, backsliding, complaining, not having enough guts to pick up their cross and execute the spiritual life, which means sometimes picking up your cross wasn't something that Jesus did with a, a smile on his face and said, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Father. And he walked around with the cross smiling with a Pepsi uh, toothpaste smile. Huh. No, no, not Jesus. He went through suffering. He cried. Sometimes we've got to go through that suffering, don't we? We've got to cry. For all the day long, we're, we're considered sleep, sheep as that are going to be slaughtered sometimes. What do we do about that? Do we murmur? Do we complain? Or do we pick up the pieces and say, you know what? I'm going to make something out of my life. I like what Pastor Rick said, that when he hears truth now, you can walk out of the building. Never being condemned. If anything, convicted. Conviction always gives you a way out. Condemnation keeps you in bondage. Conviction is God the Holy Spirit saying, okay, you've heard the truth. Why not start today for the rest of your life to serve and honor me as best as you can and forget about your past? And God says, you still, you still are alive. And as long as you still are alive, you still have an opportunity to become a winner believer before the day of your death or the rapture comes. <laughs> Amen to that. So they want to go backward, do you? They want to withdraw, do you? 
They have forgotten where they came from. They thought the, it was better. The grass is always greener on the other side. Never forget where you came from and what the Lord delivered you from. Look at what the Lord said to the Jews who wanted to go back to Egypt. Go to Deuteronomy 5. I read this just recently. I don't know if I read it to you or read it in my private studies, but Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. <clears throat> Where Moses is speaking, the Lord says, I want you to say this to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 5, 15. You shall, the word is what? Remember that you were once a slave in the land of Egypt. Remember that you used to be a slave in the land of Egypt. You don't want to go back there into slavery, into vomit. Listen, you got a divorce from a terrible marriage. You don't want to say, oh, I think I'll go back to that now. You've already been there once. How about, why do you want to go back to the same thing that did not work out the first time? What do you think, things are going to be different? People change here. People do change, but they don't normally change for the better. A lot of them change for the worse. Why do you want to go back to the things the Lord has delivered you from and has given you victory over? The Lord said, you shall remember that you were once a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God, notice who brought them out, the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm, his hand and his arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day, which is a day of rest. Notice that our Lord said this to the Jews who wanted to go back to Egypt. You need to remember where you came from and how I'm the one who delivered you from that. And if I delivered you from that, why don't you start to enjoy what I delivered you from? Amen. In the business world, look at Deuteronomy 8, 18. Whatever, whenever you are successful, never forget who gave you the ability to be successful. Sometimes people say, well, I'm a good businessman. <laughs> no, in spite of you, not because of you. Deuteronomy 8, 18. You shall what? Remember the Lord your God. For he is the one giving you power to make wealth. Remember that when you take the offering this morning, that the one who's given you the power to make that wealth is the Lord. What are you going to do? He's saying, so he says, I want you to worship me with that which I have given you the power to make. And the more you give, the more you get, according to the word of God. Given it shall be what? Given unto you. A lot of times, there's a lot of people, and there's some here this morning, I guarantee you, they're broke, flat broke. They can't afford a thing. I guarantee you, if you do a search, if they did a search in their heart, they'd find out it's because they have rejected to give so it could be given unto them. They have violated the very laws of giving that's found in the word of God. People say, well, I, I tithe. The Old Testament saints, they tithe under the law. Just because tithing is not for today, that doesn't mean you don't give God as much as you can. You have to remember, where did you get your power? Where did you get that house? Where did you get that automobile? Where did you get those clothes on your back? Where did you get your bank account? Where did you get that which you have right now? And the Lord wants to give you more. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper, 3 John verse 2, and also be in good health so you can enjoy your prosperity, 3 John verse 2. So you shall remember the Lord your God, for he's the one giving you power to what? make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as is this day. When you are in a gym or some form of trial and testing, you've got two choices. Either you're going to pick up the, the word of God and go forward, or you're going to want to go back to the cosmic system, back to the world, what God has delivered you from. When you're in a jam or any form of trial, never forget who is with you. Psalm 77, 11 says, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. What did the Jews need to do? Remember the 10 plagues? Remember the miracles? Why is it that the younger generation, the prep school generation, are the ones who went in the promised land? Because they remembered the 10 plagues and they remembered the 10 miracles in the desert. And they were victorious. They knew that God was with them and God had given them the victory. What more does God have to do to prove how much he loves you? Think of taking your favorite child and allowing your child to go to another country, a place that they're not even going to accept him, they're going to reject him, and have that child die for the mistakes of those individuals and then have those individuals spit upon that child. And God said, I'm still going to give him I'm to those people because I don't just love the church. I love the entire world. God so loved what? The world. The world. 
that he gave his uniquely born son, that whoever believes in him would never perish but have eternal life. That was the problem with the children of Israel. They forgot. Psalm 106, 7 says it like this. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. See, I didn't tell Pastor Rick you, that he, I was going to speak on this this morning. Did we talk? No. You quoted this, didn't you? Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not what? Remember. That's the main problem. We forget. We're so occupied with ourselves and what we want now and what we want in the future that we forget all the times God came through for us. We forget that when everybody was against you, there was someone that was not against you. We forget that when people were lying against you and people were saying evil things, there was someone comforting you. We forget to remember such a picture like that little picture that they have out of footsteps. Remember footsteps? where they see only one set of foot, uh, prints in the sand, and the man thought that he was going through the trials by himself, and, and then the Lord said, no, those were the times that I carried you. In my outstretched arm, in my hands, I carried you and pulled you through there. Do you remember that? If you did, you'd never want to go back to Egypt. So you want to go back to Egypt. Keith Green has an excellent song called So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. I, I have the song somewhere. I was going to play it, but I can't find it. But it's somewhere up here or somewhere in here. But uh, maybe I can find it before the day is over. I don't know, before the service is over. But I'll let you hear it if I can. But don't forget what the Lord has done. Don't forget. There's so many believers who have seen and heard the wonderful works of God. Our fathers in Egypt didn't understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses. kindnesses that's grace. But instead they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. So many believers who have seen and heard the wonderful doctrines of God. They've seen and heard and saw the power of God. All of you have gone through situations in your life where you know God blessed you. You know you have a guardian angel, don't you? The day you fell asleep at the wheel in your, your car, I remember I fell asleep at the wheel one night, one day, my car did a 360 three times, and when I woke up, I was right back in the same lane, driving forward, Now I stayed awake for the rest of the ride home, you can bet, because when your car does that, you realize, that's it, I'm out, <laughs> I wasn't out after that. Now, you're not telling me that I didn't have a guardian angel. In fact, my guardian angels get, get paid double time. I'm sure I'm under double, double, I'm under double discipline and double blessing. I gotta have double angels. Some of you, by, by the way, probably even have more than me. So don't just laugh at me. But he's there. He's come through for you, hasn't he? You've seen the power of God. I got a child right now sitting in this local assembly. That he's one of the reasons I'm up here right now, because I saw the power of God heal him from a form of leukemia. I saw the power of God. I made a commitment to God that day. Never forget it. Still remember it now. I've seen the power of God, so have you. Remember it. Don't forget it. He's always been there for you. It's time for us to remember all it is that he's done for us. Why do you think we have a command, the only commandment in the Bible that says, remember him. Remember, he died. He shed his blood. He gave his body. Remember. Stop remembering people and what people have done to you. Remember God and what God has done for you. That's what you need to do. <laughs> Remembering doctrine under pressure is what the psalmist said in Psalm 119.52, I have remembered your ordinances from of old, O Lord, and I comfort what? Myself. When you remember God's word, you can comfort you. That's what the children of Israel needed to do. Back in closing now to Numbers 14.5. The action of Moses is the next principle we need to know. We're going to have to stop here this morning because of time. But notice what it says in 14.5. After they wanted to go back to Egypt, I get a kick out of the passage that Rick read on, in Mark 8 when they said we want bread after they saw the signs and wonders. I get a kick out of this passage too because after they want to replace the leaders, notice what the leaders do. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Can you imagine the people say, we want to get rid of you. We want a new leader, a new leader. And here you are going, you want a new leader? And they both say, all right, and they fall on their face. And that is your leadership right now, falling on their face. But they were falling on their face to intercede for the fact that the people were so rebellious and complaining so much that they needed to have their eyes open. They needed to remember all it is that God had done for them. 
Moses now makes the first speech since they have been murmuring and complaining. Now imagine having this attitude like this when, when you have an attitude like this, thinking about people when the very same people that you are thinking about are hating you and even wanting to kill you. Matthew 5, says, you better learn to love your enemies. That's the mind of Christ. They had an attitude, both Moses and Aaron, give them credit here, especially Aaron, give me some credit here where he said, you know what? We're gonna pray and intercede for these people. The very ones that are hating them want to see them replaced. What did they do? They took their mind off the people. They took their eyes off people. They took their eyes off themselves and they put their eyes upon him. Don't get people conscious. If you do, they'll drive you crazy. Everybody, amen, is right. Everybody has a sick head and a deceitful heart, amen? amen? From the top of their head to the bottom of their foot, there's no soundness in them, amen? amen. Then why trust them? <laughs> Instead of saying, I can't believe they did this to me, you should say, I can't believe they did actually bless me. Look at the positive, not the negative. Not, I can't believe they did this to me of all people. You should say, well, I can't believe they said hello. <laughs> Look at the glass being half full instead of half empty. Remember him. The words of Moses are actually given in my final passage in Deuteronomy 1, so you might as well go there in 29. I got 10 minutes, so bear with me. <clears throat> These are the words given. Moses is recalling that now what he said to this people at this very section in Numbers 14. He's recording this verse at Kadesh Barnea in Deuteronomy 129. He's reminding them. He said, don't you remember now, in Deuteronomy 129, then I said to you, do not be shocked when they saw the enemies. He said, didn't I tell you before when you saw them, do not be shocked nor fear them. Notice the word shock because Moses recognizes their mental illness. They are shocked at everything going on. They're all screwed up in their head. The Lord your God, he says, who goes before you will himself to self fight on your behalf. Isn't that great? You got a problem? The Lord's going to go before you and fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Remember what he did for you in Egypt? He's going to do it again. The Lord doesn't change. And in the wilderness, when you, where you saw how the Lord your God, what did he do? Carried you, just as a man carries his son in all the way in which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. There's the presence of God. Then I said to you, do not be what? Shocked. Don't be shocked at the people. Don't be shocked at your problem, the giant. Do not be shocked, nor fear them. Notice the word shocked. He's recognizing again they are mental because the Lord your God who goes before you, as he says, will actually fight for you. It's time to remember God. Moses gave this message many times. You know why? They kept on rejecting it after he gave it, but he didn't stop giving it. And every time he gave it, there was a certain group of people who kept on hearing it, and they're the ones who perceived it, metabolized it, and applied it. I said to, uh, I said to um, oh, who did I say it to? I forget. I think it was Jason this morning. I said, Jason, I want you to concentrate on that prep school. I said, I want to get it to be improved. I said, you never know. That might be the next pivot. There's some people right now, I remember them, when they were seven and eight years old, they're here right now as adults. That might be the next pivot. You don't know how long they're gonna live. You don't know how long the Lord's gonna tarry. Yeah, I know what the signs say, but there's no guarantee when he's going to come back the exact day, the exact year. I mean, we could predict the month because of the feast, but we don't know the exact year. We can guess on the year, but we don't know. The Lord, can, the, Lord, the Lord can do whatever he wants. He can change things whenever he wants. He can do things that are shocking to us. We might interpret a passage one way, and in the end times we find out that God opens up our eyes to see it in another fresh way. So we can't live living in fear of what's going to happen in the future. We need to live in one day at a time glorifying the Lord with all our heart and soul and remembering the fantastic things he did for us and he has done for us and having that type of attitude. And always remember what Paul said to the Jews in Romans 9:16. It doesn't depend upon the man who wills something or upon the man who runs, but everything depends on God who has mercy, grace, for our present state, mercy for our past mistakes. Everything depends upon 
us remembering him and not wanting to go back to the way things used to be. Let us pray. Grateful, Father, once again, we are grateful to gather together with the people of God. We're grateful for those who may be here this morning who have never been born again and saved, those listening to my voice maybe on the internet or in any other realm. If you've never believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, yes, you may have believed that he exists and that he, he is God, but if you've never really believed in him in the sense of trusting him and wanting to rely upon him, now's the time you can make that decision. For the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So right now, forming the sentences in your thought only, you can tell God that you're willing to believe upon his son Jesus Christ for eternal life, that you're trusting in him and his character. You believe that he died for your sins. You believe that God rose him from the dead and you want to become a child of God. You can do so by making that one-shot decision of offering faith in the Lord telling God you recognize you're a sinner and you want to trust and rely upon his son Jesus Christ for eternal life. For the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Father, once again, thank you for this privilege you've given us to gather together with members of our royal family. And we ask that you just challenge us with the information that we've had. Thank you for our service that we also have this morning. May your blessing be with each one as we get ready to close the service. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray, amen. All right.